All right, so before we start talking about power and effect size today, there's something that I said in the last class that was a mistake. So I want to correct that so everyone is on the right track. So a student found the mistake while they're doing the homework. They're like, Dr. Knapp, you know, I'm doing the homework, and I, on the slide it says this, but on the homework, that's not the right answer. So what's going on? So actually, the homework, the thing that I had as the right answer on the homework was correct. It was what was on the slide that was wrong. So for those of you that didn't pick it up, previously I had mentioned alpha as being the minimum p-value that you would accept, when it actually should be the maximum p-value that you would take to reject the null. So let's take a look at why that is. So imagine that we have the binomial uh, probability mass function, okay? And so this actually isn't a line, but it's a whole bunch of dots. Now, if we said that alpha uh, is the minimum that we're going to accept, remember when we drew the cutoff and we said we're going to add up everything beneath those, uh, beneath that line? Well, if alpha is the minimum that we would accept, that means that we would accept a p-value of 1, right? p-value of 1 means that you would always get something this extreme or more. Right? But if we instead say that alpha is the maximum p-value that we will reject the null, then we're only going to reject the null when the p-value is small, when the p-value is beneath that, right? So good job to the student who found that error. They got one point of extra credit. Okay, so let's talk about, where's my eraser? Let's talk about power and effect size. First though, I want to review a couple things from lab two that aren't on the video. <clears throat> so, last Friday during the lab, we talked about the binomial test in terms of successes and failures. So rather than saying P heads, P not heads, we said that, okay, let's call heads a success and anything else is a failure. And one of the benefits of talking about successes and failures is that we can talk about power and effect size today without ever mentioning heads and tails, or male and female, or sight and non sight So what we're going to talk about today is general to any type of outcomes that you can break down into two classes, into two categories. So today we'll talk about successes and failures. Also, we talked about the probability mass function, which shows us the probability for getting some number of successes in some number of observations when the parameter p success that we get from the null hypothesis is actually true. So let's take a look at the probability mass function for 50 trials where probability of success is 0.5. So here are the number of successes from 0 to 50. Here is the probability mass, which indicates the probability of observing an outcome with that number of successes. So for outcomes where we have like zero successes, the probability of observing something with zero successes is really, really low. The most probable outcome with a probability of almost 0.12 is the, the midpoint there, 25 successes, which you would expect, right? If you have 50 flips, sorry, if you have 50 trials, and the probability of a success is 0.5, you should get a success half of the time, right? That's what you would expect. So we have 25 is the most probable. Now, looking at this, we can notice some things about it. So what things can we notice about it? It's symmetric, right? So this is a symmetrical distribution. Now, on Friday, I talked about when it would be symmetrical and when it would not be symmetrical. Here it's symmetrical. Why? Yeah, the two things are equally probable, right? The probability of success equals the probability of failure. The probability of success is 0.5. When the probability of success is not 0.5, you won't get a symmetrical distribution. We also have two tails, right? Most of the mass, most of the probability is compacted here in the middle, and then we have little probabilities as we get off towards the edge. So these edges, these are called the tails, okay? All right, so how do we get the p-value? So if we say our null hypothesis is that the probability of success is 0.5, what other information do we need to know? 
to get people. We need to know the probability of success. We need to know how many times that we're flipping it, right? So to get the p-value, we just need to add up all of the probabilities from the probability mass function that are equal or below the probability of observing the observed number of successes for that many trials. So imagine that we've got this as our null hypothesis. We're doing 50 statistical experiments, and we get 18 successes. So here's the probability mass function, right? So where is the probability of 18 successes? Can anyone point to it? I have a laser pointer on here. Little no button. So right here, laser pointer. Is that the probability of getting 18 successes? No. Where is it? Can you pass it? Yeah, the probability of 18 successes is like right there, right? So say this again. I thought we uh, put or R G of numbers. Uh -huh. uh, well, so we can look here. We got 50, uh, 50 flips. But she's absolutely right. So she thought that the number of trials or observations that we had was eight uh, was thirty six. If we had thirty six flips, thirty six trials, then eighteen would have been right in the middle. But we didn't have thirty six. We had fifty. So this means that 18, that's right about there. So, oh, there we go. 20, 19, 18. So this is the probability of getting 18 successes, right? If we draw a line through this probability, we can add up basically all of the probabilities that are beneath that line to get the p-value. This is what we did on Friday, right? So we're just going to add up everything on or under the line. Now, we're interested in both tails because our null hypothesis was non-directional. What does that mean, non-directional? What we said, the null hypothesis was that probability of success equals 0.5, right? So what are the alternatives? What is not equal to 0.5? What's a number that doesn't equal 0.5? 0 0.6. 0 0.6 doesn't equal 0.5, right? If the true probability was 0 0.6, we're interested in that, right? What's another number that's not 0 0.5? 0 0.4. 0 0.4 is also different than 0 0.5, right? We're interested in finding out if the true probability is, is greater than or is less than. Does that make sense? So we're interested in situations on both sides of this function. Okay, so here, if we do this, we add up all of the probabilities, we get the p-value that is approximately equal to 0 0.065. What should we do? We need to compare that to something, right? What do we compare to? We compare it to alpha. And what did I say we're going to use as alpha unless we say otherwise? So alpha is 0.05, oh, oh, right? Yeah. So is this greater than or equal to or less than 0.05? Greater. This is greater than 0.05, so what should we do? We fail to reject an all hypothesis. That's exactly right. Now, that was an example where we were interested in two tails, right? So our null hypothesis was that probability of success equals 0.5. So we are interested in finding if the probability is greater than 0.5 or is less than 0.5, right? Now let's take a look at a different null hypothesis. So imagine we have a, a null hypothesis where the probability of success is less than or equal to 0.5. In this situation, what alternatives are we interested in? So before, people came up with numbers 0.4 and 0.6, and I said, for this situation, we're interested in both of those things, right? There are still two tails of the distribution, absolutely, but which tail are we interested in? Less than, okay, so. Here's our distribution, so here's 0.5, Here's everything that's less than 0.5. So now if the null hypothesis says 
that we are in that the probability is 0.5 or less. Are we interested in this tail? We're actually interested in this tail. Why? If it turns out that the probability is 0.1, let's say that this is where the net is, where 0.1 would be. If that was the case, where the probability really was 0.1, would we reject or fail to reject an null hypothesis? Now, the null hypothesis says that it's less than or equal to 0.5, right? So if the true probability of success is 0.1, is that less than or equal to 5? Point 0.1 is less than or equal to 5, right? So if we have a point 0.1, what should we do? We should fail to reject. That's consistent with this hypothesis. So actually, we are interested in one tail, but it's this one that we're interested in. No? <laughs> Which tail is going to allow us to reject the null hypothesis? If we have an observation that it's less than, <coughs> then we fail to reject it. Right? Because the null hypothesis says it can be less than. Right? So we're only going to reject the null hypothesis if we find a statistically significant difference that's greater than. Okay? Does that make sense now? Okay. We can do the next one and go through the logic again. So this is a one tail hypothesis. How about this hypothesis? Probability of success is greater than or equal to 0.5. It's one tail. Which tail? The less than side, right? So, all right, so here's 0.5. And we're saying that the probability is 0.5 or greater. Right? So if we get a probability that's greater, we're not going to reject the null hypothesis. We only want to reject the null hypothesis if the evidence suggests that this is wrong. If the, we observe something out here, well, that's consistent with this being greater. So we're interested in that tail. Ruby? Yes? Show that boy that? All right. Have some hypotheses. Null hypothesis. Notice one important thing of all of those null hypotheses is they all gave us a starting point. Remember how I said that the null hypothesis needs to provide us with a parameter? Each of those gave us a parameter. None of those said just greater than. None of those said just less than. They said equal to or equal to greater than, equal to less than, right? So that equal to gives us the parameter that we're looking for. Now if we say that probability of success is less than or equal to 0.7. And we have our distribution. And let's say this is 0.7. It's been shifted. It's, let me draw a non-symmetric distribution. Something like that. 0.7 is there. Now, we're only going to want to reject the null if the evidence suggests that this is false, right? So if we're saying that the probability is less than or equal to 7, that's saying that the probability is somewhere in here or on this line, right? So we're only going to reject the null if the probability is on this side and statistically significant. Okay? So the tail that we're interested in 
if we have a directional null hypothesis, is always the tail in the opposite direction. So here, it's less than, so we're interested in the greater tail. If this was greater than, then we would be saying that we think the probability is on this line or in here, right? So we're only going to reject the null hypothesis if we find a statistically significant difference on this side. Okay, hopefully that's better. Alright, now, imagine we have an all hypothesis that probability of success is less than or equal to 0.5. If we get zero successes, should we reject them all? No. Just sort of did this. No, right? Because we're predicting that the null hypothesis is saying that it could be 5, 0.5 or less. Well, that's less than 0.5, so that's consistent with the null hypothesis. Now, the thing that might be confusing is that if you calculate the probability for events as or more extreme, the way that we previously defined it, you know, by drawing that line through and just adding up everything underneath that, the probability of observing something like that is really, really low. So this doesn't match with our intuition that we should not, I'm sorry, that we should fail to reject. So let's see why this is by using a couple examples. Let's look at the less confusing example first with 18 successes. So here we again have our uh, probability mass function for up to 50 uh, trials. Now, the probability of getting 18 successes, where was that again? Can you point to it again for me? Excuse me, just a moment. Did you get it? No, we have 50 trials. 18? Just look. 0, 10, 20. So 18 should be. Yeah, there you go. Okay, now we're interested in one tail because our null hypothesis was directional, right? Which tail are we interested in? So imagine we've got. 0.5 there. Which tail? We're interested in this one, right? Because the null hypothesis says that it's 0.5 or greater. That's over here. So we're interested in this one. Yes. Yeah, okay. So, 18. Is it in that tail? Is 18 successes, is that in the tail that we're interested in? Yes. For rejecting the null hypothesis? Mm -hmm. No? Yes. No, yes. Okay, uh, maybe we still don't understand which tail we're interested in, right? So the null hypothesis says that it's here or greater, right? This is the null hypothesis. We want to figure out if we need to reject this null hypothesis. The only time we're going to reject this null hypothesis is if we're in this side, right? So is 18 on that side, the side that we can use to reject? Yes, yes it is. There it is. Now, before, I added up all of the probabilities that were underneath that. So I added up all of these, I also added up all of these. What have I done differently here? I've colored the ones that I'm adding up. I didn't add these into it, why not? Because we're interested in the side, right? Good. So all we need to do is add up these to get the probability that we're interested in. So there's a probability of 18 successes. As a more extreme doesn't include these because they're predicted by the null hypothesis. They're predicted by the null hypothesis, then they're really not that extreme. Does that make sense? All right, so we do that, and the probability is 0.032. The p value. So what should we do? Reject we reject the null hypothesis, right? Alpha is what? 0.05. 0 .05. Is that less than 0.05? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. 
So we reject them all hypothesis. Okay, now I, I, I switch this. Whoop, whoop. Okay, so where is it getting messy? Okay, so now where am I going to be rejecting the null hypothesis? Over here? No. We fail to reject on this side? Yes. Less than or equal to 0.5. So we're going to fail to reject when it's 5 or less than 5, right? This, this is good. All right, so we have, again, 18 successes. That's the number of successes that we're working with, right? Okay, so where are 18 successes? Boom, again, it's here. Now, I have added up everything that's red again. Notice what I'm adding up is a little bit different than what we've added up before. Yeah. So what if I added up this time? Notice when this was like that, we added up everything here, right? So if we flip this, what should we be adding up? Everything on the other side. Okay? Does that make sense? Even though these really aren't that extreme, these, if you think about the, this, forget what I'm trying to say. I'm not going to be able to say it the way I want to. Just think about that we are going to add up the opposite side than we were before, right? We're interested in this tail. So if we think about everything on this side, there we go. All right, so. If we do that, the p-value is 0.984. What should we do? Fail to reject, right? Which makes a whole lot of sense. This is exactly what's predicted by that null hypothesis. So we should fail to reject, right? Beautiful. Okay, so as a more extreme, this is an important question not only for the p-values, but for alphas as well. Right? We talked about alphas. So an alpha of 0.05. What we're saying is with a, a non-directional hypothesis, we're putting half of our alpha on each tail. Right? If we have a directional hypothesis, where are we going to put the alpha? Well, we're not going to put it on both tails because we're only interested really in one of the tails. So we're going to put all of our alpha in one tail. So, for null hypotheses like this, is greater than or equal to, which tail are we interested in? Are we interested in the greater tail or the less tail? Yes, the less tail, right? So the less tail. So this would be an alternative hypothesis of less than. How about the null hypothesis of equals? Which tail are we interested in? We're interested in both, right? Because both less than and greater than are not equal to. So we are interested in both tails. So we will calculate the p-values using both tails. We will distribute our alpha over both tails. So our alternative hypothesis, what type of alternative hypothesis would this be? It's less than or greater than, right? Now notice, if you Think about the alternative hypothesis and the signs that are used in the alternative hypothesis. They point towards the tail you're interested in, right? Is it pointing the same way as this? These? Pointing the same way as those. All right, and finally, for an all hypothesis of less than or equal to, which tail are we interested in? We're interested in the greater tail. So our alternative hypothesis would be that it's greater than whatever parameter that we've given it. Good. All right. So, we've talked
talked a couple times about proof, right? And in statistics, we're not going to prove things. Because we can't prove things like with mathematics, right? With mathematics, I can prove that this equation is equal to that equation, right? I can do that in math. But in statistics, I'm not going to be able to do this. This means that I'm going to make mistakes sometimes, right? So if our null hypothesis is that the probability of success equals 0.5, and we have an alpha of 0.5. This is a two-tailed alpha, right? Because we have a non-directional null hypothesis, right? So we're interested in both of those tails. Now, if we have a sample size of 50, we're going to reject the null hypothesis when we observe 33 or more successes, or 17 or fewer successes. I'm sorry? You mean did I do it? And how did how did we know like thirty-three? Ha ha ha! This is a good question. How do we know that it's thirty-three? How do we know that it's seventeen? So for this class, I am skipping that. We'll do this on Friday in R, and I'll show you exactly how you can find what the cutoffs are. But basically, what I was doing was I was saying, okay, so here's our distribution. Now, what happens if we set the cutoff at 18, then what's our p-value for that? Is that less than or equal to 0.05? Okay, how about 19? Is that less than or equal to 0.05? How about 17? Is that less than or equal to 0.05, right? And by doing that, you can figure out which values will give you the p-values that are beneath alpha. Okay? So, We'll show you how to do this much more easily on Friday using cumulative mass functions. All right. So these are the cutoffs. You can check them in R if you want. I have the code. So for lectures, when I use R as part of the lecture, which I did for the graphs, I'm posting up the code that I use to get the graphs and the analyses. So if you click that code, you can see how I got these. Okay. All right, anyway, if the null hypothesis is correct, we're going to incorrectly reject it about 3.3% of the time. Now, you, you are probably going to say, wait, that's, that's not 0.5, or that's not 5% of the time, right? If alpha is 5, we should incorrectly reject it 5% of the time. However, because none of our observations have p-values that are uh, exactly equal to 0.5, so if you did this and looked at the p-value for 19 and 18 and 17 and 16, none of these give you exactly 0.5. With later um, topics, we'll see where you will get exactly the right case. But here, we're going to incorrectly reject it about 3.3% of the time. So here's our probability mass function. Our regions of rejection are going to be over here, right? because we're interested in both tails. So applying the, the cutoffs, so at, what did I say, 17 and 33, was it? Yeah, 17 and 33. So we are going to reject the null hypothesis if we get 17 or fewer successes. We're also going to reject the null hypothesis if we get 33 or more, okay? All right. If we get somewhere in between there, 18 to 32, you're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis. All right, so the regions of rejection are going to produce alpha errors when the null hypothesis is true, right? Because sometimes when the null hypothesis is true, you'll get values like this. They're improbable, but they still happen. So we make alpha errors. Now, the alpha errors, we also call them type 1 errors. This is when you reject an all hypothesis when it's true. What other type of error is there? There's a, the second type of error, type 2 error. It's a beta, right? If alpha is the type 1, then beta is going to be the type 2. And what is a beta error? Well, if alpha is rejecting an all hypothesis when it's true, what would the beta error be? Failing to reject the null hypothesis when, when it's false or when it's not true. That's right. 
So that's a beta or a type 2 error. Now, we can calculate the probability of making this type of error. Now, to do this, we're going to need everything that we needed to calculate the probabilities of things before. So that is, we need a null hypothesis, right? That gives us the parameter that we're going to use to determine the original uh, probability mass function. We're going to need to know what alpha is going to be so we can set the cutoffs. We're going to need to know what the sample size is because the cutoffs and the shape of that distribution is going to depend on the sample size, right? So this is everything that we needed to do before. What else do you think we're going to need to know to calculate the fate? Okay, how many times we actually observed the coin coming up heads for the number of successes in that many trials, right? Now, remember when we talked about the law of large numbers? If we do this a lot, the probability of getting successes over a large number of flips is going to tell you what? The probability of, of success, right? So, if we do lots of flips, the number of successes that we get, if we divide that by the total number of flips that we did, this will give us the percent of successes or the probability of success. Right? So if we do this a lot, what it should give us is a true probability of success. So this was the probability of success that the null hypothesis said. But that, not, that is not necessarily the case. Right? The true probability could be different. So we need one more piece of information, and that is a specific alternative probability of success. How about probability of success is 0.6. Now, if we did a lot of flips, we could use the, the probability that we actually observed, right? But we haven't done any flips yet. So let's imagine that we're interested in seeing you know, how good we're able to detect, how well we're able to reject an all hypothesis when the true probability is actually 0.6, okay? That's what we're interested in when we're talking about beta. Okay, so here is not the mass function for our specific alternative. This is the mass function for the null hypothesis, right? Zero to 50, we have an alpha of 0.05. We have our cutoff set right there, right? At uh, less than or equal to 17 and at greater than or equal to 33, right? So this is what we get from the null hypothesis, sample size, and alpha. Now, what we're saying is that we have a specific alternative hypothesis. So now let's compute the mass function for our specific alternative. That's this. So the mass function for probability 0.5 is like this. For 0.6, it's like that. What's happening? As, say what? It's not symmetric. It's not symmetric anymore, right? This tail is a lot longer than this tail is, right? So it's not symmetric anymore. What else has happened? Well, with 0.5, if the probability was 0.5, we would expect to see 25 successes in 50 flips in the long run, right? But if the probability was really 0.6, what should we expect in the long run? You should expect 30, right? 0.6 times 50, 30. Woo! Well, it just shifted things over, and it changed the shape of the distribution. So the shape is determined by the alternative, the specific alternative hypothesis that we have, and by the sample size. The cutoffs are determined by the null hypothesis, alpha, and the sample size. If you sum all of these up, this will give you beta. So what did I say beta was again? Beta is type 2 error. And what is a type 2 error? Failing to reject when you should, right? If you fail to reject, in here we're failing to reject. But if this really is true, if the probability of success really is 0.6, we're going to fail to reject all within here, right? So we can sum these up to get the probability of incorrectly
failing to reject. Okay? That's faith. If we sum everything inside the regions of rejection, this is going to give you power. Power and beta are what type of things? Think about outcomes. We talked about independent, mutually exclusive, complementary, not mutually exclusive, what are they? They're complementary, right? So the sum of beta and power will give you what? That's exactly right. So if we know beta, let's sum all those up. Beta is 0.76. So what is power? Point? Point 0.24. Point 0.24. That's exactly right. You can just subtract beta from 1, since you know that those are complementary. They describe everything. All right, so beta is 0.76. Power is 0.24 for our example. That really sucks. Why does it suck? Why does it suck? Why does beta equal to 0.76, approximately? Why does that suck? What does beta mean again? Failing to reject inappropriately, or incorrectly failing to reject. This means that when the probability of success really is 0.6, we will incorrectly fail to reject 74% of the time. Or, I'm sorry, 76% of the time. Wow! That, that means that we're like missing it a lot, right? Three out of four times, we're missing it. So this isn't good. So we're incorrectly failing to reject 76% of the time, that's related to the beta, and we would correctly reject the null hypothesis only about one quarter of the time, right? This is related to the power. So the question now is, how can we reduce beta? Or since they're complementary, how can we increase power? Does anyone have ideas about how we can do those? We can decrease. We can decrease alpha. Would that work, decreasing alpha? I have a couple of people indicating no. Who thinks it would de decreasing alpha would work? Who thinks decreasing alpha would not work? Good. More of you guys got that decreasing alpha would not work. Decreasing alpha would not work. What would work with alpha? <laughs> increasing alpha would work. Let's, let's take a look again at the information from the last side. So I said that the shape is determined by the alternative that we're looking at and sample size, and that the cutoffs are determined by the null hypothesis, alpha, and the sample size. So, if we want to change when we're rejecting the null hypothesis, right, what could we change? What determines when we reject? Well, one of the things is alpha. What are other things that we could change? We could change sample size. What else could we change? The, the number of successes there or the particular alternative that we're looking at, right? Anything else? Got sample size, alpha, the alternative, one more thing. Not p value. The p value we just calculate based on everything else. <laughs> We can change something that will change what values our p-values take. The null hypothesis. That was the last thing here, the null hypothesis. How can you change the null hypothesis to change the p-values? What did we talk about like very early on in the slides? We talked about one versus Tails. We can perhaps use a null hypothesis where we're looking at one tail instead of two tails. Right? So let's look at these things. Let's look at increasing alpha first. So increasing alpha. 
This is going to bring the cutoffs closer to the expected value. And I'll we'll show this in just a second. This is going to increase the size of the rejection region, which will decrease B and increase power. So before we used an alpha of 0.05, right? And with an alpha of 0.05, the cutoffs were 33 or more and 17 or less, right? If we increase alpha to 0.1, instead of needing 33 or more, now we just need 32 or more. And on Friday, I'll show you how we, can, we calculated that, that 32 is our cutoff here. Alternatively, on the other end, on the other tail, instead of previously needing 17 or fewer, we now need 18 or fewer. Okay? So this is what we had from last time. This was with an alpha of 0.05. Now, as we increase alpha to 0.1, we get this, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0.1. What's happening? It's decreasing the cutoffs. So we have our probability mass function. And with alpha 0.05, we're cutting off 5%, 2.5% over here, 2.5% over here. <laughs> By now saying, okay, alpha is now going to be 0.1, what's happening? Well, now we have 5% over here that we can get rid of. 5% over here. Okay? So we are making the cutoffs closer to the expected value, which is making those regions of rejection larger. So before they were like this big, and now, well, they're a little bit larger. Okay, so increasing alpha is going to make the regions of rejection larger. Here, if the null hypothesis were that the probability of success is 0.5, with an alpha of 0.1, 50 observations, and a true probability of uh, 0.6 for getting a success. Now our uh, power is 0 0.66. I'm sorry, not our power. Our beta is 0 0.66. What was our beta before? Our beta before was 0.76. So before we were incorrectly failing to reject the null hypothesis 76% of the time. Now we're only incorrectly failing to reject the null hypothesis 66% of the time. We're still incorrectly rejecting it a lot, but it's less. it's less. We are making the mistake less often. That's a good thing. So what's power? Sorry, 0.34. Good. Okay, so we just increased alpha. Now let's see what happens if we use a directional hypothesis, okay? So previously we said that uh, our null hypothesis was that we, it was, uh, the probability of success was equal to 0.5. What if instead we said uh, the probability of success is less than or equal to 0.5? Less than or equal. Which side now are we interested in? Which tail are we interested in? We're interested in the greater side, right? So now if we're interested in the greater side, we have 5% of alpha over here that we're never going to use, right? Because we said before that we just set alpha to 0.1. So if we're really only interested in this side, we don't need to have any alpha over here because we're never going to reject it over here, right? So what can we do? We can take all of the alpha that's over here and put it over here. Does that make sense? So how did we put that? Did anyone get that? So before we had a non-directional hypothesis, right? So we're interested in whenever the true probability is different from 0.5. So we're interested in both sides of the tails. This means that when the p-value is less than or equal to 0.05 on the one side, or the p-value is less than or equal on the other side, 
we're going to reject the null hypothesis, right? Now, normally we use the 5% cutoffs, but before we just increased it to 0.1 instead of 0.5, right? So now, whenever the p-value on either side is less than or equal to 0.1, we're going to be rejected, right? Now, in calculating the p-value for the, uh, the non-directional hypothesis, we're adding up all of these and all of those, right? Right? We're interested in both sides, so we're going to sum up basically everything beneath that line, right? But now if we have a directional hypothesis that the null is less than or equal to, so that means that the null is predicting the stuff over here, right? Are you with me so far? So we want to reject whenever the null, or whenever we have sufficient evidence that the null is wrong and that the true probability is greater than. So that's over here. But since we're only interested in this tail now, we're not adding up these values when we're computing the p-value anymore. Right? So here, if we just have these values, so before I had 10%, so I have 5% on this side and 5% on this side, so the p-value for the non-directional, like here, would be 0.1 and we would reject. Now, we're not including this. So if the alpha is really 0.1, not only will we reject here, but we'll also reject here, right? We'll reject up to a different cutoff that includes 10%. 10% from here to here, 5% from here to there, right? Does that help? All right, so for a cutoff of alpha equals 1, for a one-tail test, this is going to be 31 or more successes. How many more, or how many successes were we looking for last time? 32 or more. So now we only need 31 or more. So if we compare the two to one tailed examples, so from last time when we had this was what we're starting with from the null hypothesis, right? And we set up these cutoffs. This should be more symmetric, this should be here, right? Anyway, so we set up those cutoffs on both sides. But here with our non-directional, or with our, excuse me, with our directional hypothesis, now we're only interested in one end. We're only interested in one tail. So we don't want to add up all of this stuff. We just want to add up stuff that's on this end, right? <coughs> so if we see what's going on, what happens to the cutoffs, so there's with a two-tail alpha of 0.1, here's a one-tail alpha of 0.1. Two tail, one tail. Two tails, one tail. Two tail, one tail. What's going on? We are no longer adding up these probabilities because we don't care about them anymore. And because we have all of this 5% roughly here that we are getting rid of, whoop, we can add it to here. Right? And so we're adding that 5% there. So we're losing this tail, and in this tail, the probabilities are all tiny, 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 tiny for each one of those. Pardon? Then we add up, right? We're going to add up everything that's on this side to get the p value. So we lost the tail with tiny, small, individual probabilities, but we gained a very highly probable outcome, right? So if you summed up the heights of each of these, and added them all together, it would go up to there. So we're taking all of this alpha and putting it over here. So what effect does this have? Let's add them up. So beta now is equal to 0.55. What's power? 
0.45. What was beta previously? 0.66. The last time we were getting it wrong, almost two thirds of the time. Now we're getting it wrong a little more than half of the time. We are incorrectly failing the objective. A little more than half of the time. That's better still. Okay, what else can we do? Well, we can increase the size. So let's imagine that we are going to use 100 observations instead of 50 observations. We can keep everything else the same, right? So the null hypothesis is still the one that we used last time. So that is the probability is less than or equal to 0.5. We're still going to use the alpha of 0.1. This is one directional. Uh, and now our new cutoff with this new sample size is 57 or more successes. So last time, with 50 observations, we had something like this. Who's going to make a prediction about what's going to happen as we increase the number of successes? What's what? Beta will be 0.44 because we went from like 0.76 to 0.66 to 0.55 to 0.44. Maybe I, I don't know if it's going to be 0.44, but I would predict that it will be less. Why? What's going to happen? What's going to make it less? We'll have more probability adding up. Okay, I agree with that. Let's take a look. Okay, so if we do it, sample size 50, sample size 100, sample size 50, sample size 100. Now, notice, I am compacting the 100 axis, right? Normally, or before this went from 0 to 50. Now it's going from 0 to 100, right? If I wanted to keep the scale the same, I'd need to come out to like there. But what's the most probable value here? 60, right? 0.6, which is the value provided by our specific alternative. 0.6 times 100 is 60. 0.6 times 50? 30, right? So this relatively, if we shrink everything so it's the same sort of relative scale, this stays in the same place. But what else happens? The cutoff shifts, right? Whoop. So it goes from here to there, here to there, right? What else? There's one more thing that I'm looking for. The ratio of successes to non-successes is changing. Can you be more specific? The sample size is getting larger, huh? Mm -hmm. Ha ha! I, I think I, I think I understand what you're saying. So the sample size is increased, right? So the law of large numbers, what does the large law of large numbers say? As you're getting a larger and larger sample, you're getting a better and better estimate of what the truth is, right? So our estimate of what the truth is, notice before we have it falling off like this. Now, relatively, ooh, notice how it's like it's getting thinner. You guys see that? So this is due to the law of large numbers. So because of the law of large numbers is operating here, the tails are getting like pulled in, right? So if we pull in the tails here, now imagine that the true, that are not the true, but the probability predicted by the null hypothesis, this was that this would be biggest at 50, right? So we had some cut fall off like this. But now also, since we're gaining more observations, those tails are getting pulled in, right? Now, if you're pulling in the tails, what's going to happen to the cutoff, right? Instead of having your cutoff being spread out far, you've got everything pulled in more, so the cutoff gets pulled in too. 
Does that make sense? That is why this cutoff shifts. Awesome. So now let's see if you are right about 0.44. Point two four. Point two four. This means that twenty four percent of the time, if the probability of success really is six, really is point six, right? That we are going to incorrectly fail to reject it only one quarter of the time, basically. That's way better. When we first started, we were incorrectly rejecting it 75% of the time. Now, it's almost 25% of the time, right? Way, 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 way better. Power, just subtract beta from one, there we go. One more thing that we can do is effect size. So this lecture was on power and effect size. So let's talk about effect size. What is effect size? <coughs> effect size is the size of an effect. <laughs> What does that mean? Imagine we're talking about Chamaja, right? We're talking about Chamaja. Do they really have one liter of soda in their one liter bottles? Now, imagine that they have like 1.01 .01 liters of soda in their bottles on average. Versus 1.1 .1 liters of soda in their bottle. Which is a larger effect size? 1.1 is a much bigger difference from the null hypothesis, right? So the effect size is basically how different the values specified by the null hypothesis and the specific alternative are. So we have the null hypothesis, probability of success equals 0.5, and the specific alternative that we've been working with, which is that the probability of success equals 0.6, right? So that's some effect size. We won't talk about how to compute effect size for a while, but it's important to sort of understand the idea. So we have some effect size, right? The difference between 0.5 and 0.6. Now, what's a bigger effect than that? 0.9. Yeah, 0.9 would be a much bigger effect size. So I didn't go quite that extreme, but I used something that's more different than what we've been using. Now, effect size is related to sample size. A larger end pulls in the tails, right? So this is going to make the relative difference greater by pulling in the tails. We'll talk more about this later. But let's try a specific alternative of probability of success equals 0.7. Before we were using 0.6, now we're using 0.7. So this is from the last time. When we had uh, one tail, that is a directional null hypothesis, probability of success is less than or equal to 0.5, right? That's saying that the probability of success is somewhere over here. We set up the cutoffs using a, a one-tailed alpha of 0.1, and that gave us this cutoff here, right? For 100, uh, for 100 trials, 100 statistical experiments. Now, when the alternative that we were working with was that the probability of success is 0.6, we had something centered on 60, right? Now, if instead of using a specific alternative of 0.6, if instead of using a specific alternative of 0.7, what's it going to center on? What's going to be the most probable outcome? If you flip it 100 times and the true probability of success is 0.7, you should see 70, right? So what should happen is that this should shift. So let's see what happens. So this was with uh, alternative of 0 0.6. Here's 0 0.7. 0 0.6, 0 0.7. It's basically shifting. It's now even less symmetrical. And it's centered on 70, right? Now, what do we do? Well, we want to know what beta is, and beta is the probability of incorrectly failing to reject. When do we fail to reject? Anytime we have this many successes, right? So we just add up all those little probabilities. All those little probabilities. 
It's really nice. They're all little probabilities. So if we sum them up, we shouldn't get a really huge answer. So if we do this, we find beta is approximately equal to 0.002. What does that mean? It means that we are almost never mistakenly failing to reject an all hypothesis when the true probability of a success is at 0.7. Right? This is cool. We went from a situation where we were almost always incorrectly rejecting an incorrect null hypothesis to now almost never incorrectly failing to reject the null hypothesis. Right? Power is very, very close to one. So, in summary, how do you increase power? What are the things that you can do to increase power? Increase alpha. You can increase alpha. Good. Increase the sample size. Good. Increase the effect size. Good. Use a directional as opposed to a non-directional hypothesis. Right? Awesome. That's it. Those are the four ways that you can increase power. Increase alpha. Use a directional hypothesis. Increase sample size. Increase the difference between the specific alternative you're interested in and the null hypothesis, which is basically increasing the effect size. So let's talk about some pros and cons and other stuff related to this. So what are the pros of increasing alpha? What are the good things about increasing alpha? You decrease beta when you increase alpha. That's a good thing. Anything else? I haven't put decreasing beta or increasing power for any of these, but they are true for each of the things that we're going to be talking about. So it increases power, decreases the beta, good, good, good. What else? Anything else that's good about increasing alpha? Increase the power. There's a bad What? What's bad about it? That's exactly right. Did everyone get that? So he said, if we increase alpha, we're going to make more mistakes. Now, we said we're going to decrease beta. Right? So we're going to decrease the beta errors, but what type of errors are we going to increase? The alpha errors. If we make alpha bigger, we're going to make more alpha errors. So an alpha error, what is that type of error again? That's when we, when we reject the null hypothesis incorrectly. Right? So by increasing alpha, we are increasing our alpha errors. We are rejecting the null hypothesis when we shouldn't more. Right? So, some pros. This is really easy to do. Really, really easy to do. I mean, what alpha do you want to use? I don't know. 0.10. Okay, you just increased it. Right? So we said that the alpha of 0.05 was kind of arbitrary in that in psychology, we like to use 0.05. Right? But you can set it to 0.1 if you want. You can set it to 0.2 if you want. Ugh. The problem with this is that then you increase your alpha errors. So we look at other ways that we can increase power without messing with alpha errors, where our alpha stays the same. So if you're going to do this, you need to do this, you need to decide this before you collect your data and run the analyses. If you look at your data and you're using an alpha of 0.05, and you say, hmm, the p-value is 0.06. Well, now what should you do? P-value is 0.06, the alpha is 0.05. You should fail to reject, right? Fail to reject. But you say, Oh, but it's 0.06. Let's just use an alpha of 0.1 instead. Right? Not good practice. If you want to increase alpha, do it before you look at your data. Because when you do it after you look at your data, you're actually compounding the alpha errors that you would make over the long run. So it's easy to do, but it increases alpha errors, 
And for this reason here, this is why I don't recommend this. This is my least favorite way of increasing power or decreasing beta errors. Using a directional null hypothesis. This ends up putting all of the alpha on one end. It doesn't change alpha. If we're using an alpha of 0.05, we still have the same amount of alpha error. We're just putting all of it on the end that we're interested in, right? We're saying, okay, we're not interested in this tail, so let's take that 2.5% and put it over here. Now, the overall alpha is going to stay the same. It stays the same. But instead, you're putting it on the side where you are hoping to be able to reject the null hypothesis, right? Now, this is also really easy to do. It's really easy to do. Okay, I'm going to do one tail instead of a two tail. Really, really simple to do. Uh, it doesn't affect the percent of alpha errors. However, it needs to be done before collecting data, and it should be theoretically justified. I mean, if you are flipping a coin, right, you think that it's going to be fair. You don't really have a good justification for saying that it should be more heads, right? Or it should be more tails. There are other questions that maybe you do have a justification for. Imagine that I like gambling with my friend. We make little bets and stuff all the time, right? And if we're breaking even, that's fine. I'm okay with that. If I'm making money, I'm okay with that too. But if he's making money most of the time, or she's making money most of the time, then maybe I don't want to gamble with that person. Does that make sense? So in that situation, I might want to use a directional null hypothesis. That the probability of success, if he's the one getting a success, is equal to or less than 0.5, right? Because if the probability of him getting it right is greater than 0.5, I don't want to be able to do it. Okay? Chama job. Imagine that you wanted to sue Chama job. If what? Are you going to sue them if they, if they gave you more soda than they were saying? No. You gave more soda than I paid for. <laughs> Actually, in America, I think you could probably get away with this. Say, look, like, oh, man, oh, 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 I'm getting fat. This is all Chama job's fault. I, I wanted to drink one liter of soda. But instead, I'm drinking 1.01 liters of soda, and over time, this adds up, and now I'm Chokshishman America. <laughs> right? But if you have a good reason to look at one end, then you're reasonable in using a directional law hypothesis. If you're interested in seeing if there was some discrimination, maybe against minorities, like maybe you're okay if there are more Kurds than you would expect at this university. But you don't want there to be discrimination against curves, right? So that would make a one-tailed prediction. I would recommend this when it's justified. When you have a good reason for doing a one-tailed test, use it. It's a great way to increase power without affecting your alpha error, but you really need a justification to do it. Okay, you can also increase sample size. So what's the pros of increasing sample size? Same as the rest, so you increase power, decrease beta. What else? Anything else? Okay, the, the law of large numbers will kick in. Okay, good. Why might it be more difficult? Because there are much more sample size we should look at. If we're going to collect a lot more observations, this could be, potentially be expensive. Even if it doesn't cost a lot more money in terms of money, it, yeah, it could cost a lot more in terms of time, right? So increasing sample size <coughs> isn't going to affect our alpha errors. So that's cool. It's going to increase power, decrease beta, but it can be expensive. And again, this you need to decide your sample size before you go out and start uh, collecting data. You don't want to look, oh, is it significant? Nope. Okay, let's collect more data. Is it significant now? Because by doing that, you will increase your alpha errors. This is my preferred way. Because it can be expensive. Let's talk about the other way. 
and then maybe we can take another look back at this. But lots of times, like if you want to collect a ton more people, like this can be really expensive. So it kind of depends on the research that you're doing. The research that I do, lots of times, like 12 subjects gives you a reasonable amount of power. So to bump it up to 24, it gives you a ton of power and it is not that much more effort. But if you have something where you're looking at a thousand participants, getting an extra thousand would be really prohibitive. Okay, so you can also increase the difference between the specific alternative that you're interested in and the null hypothesis. Now, <clears throat> this is easy to do, asterisk. So, before you do a study, you can say maybe what effect size you're interested in. So, before I said, okay, let's say that the probability of success really was 0.6. Let's say it really was 0.7, right? And then we calculated the power that we have. So, imagine that I'm gambling with my friend. And I want to know how many observations I need before I'm able to tell, before I have a reasonable power for telling some amount of effect size, right? Now, let's say that it doesn't bother me if he's right 60% of the time, right? Well, if it doesn't bother me that he's right 60% of the time, then I can look for a bigger effect size, right? 60% of the time would bother me. What wouldn't bother me? I don't know, 51%. 51% is different than 50, but we would need a huge sample size to tell the difference between 50 and 51. So I might say, okay, I'm okay with 51, so I'm not even going to care about that. So before the research begins, I can say, like, what effect size I'm interested in. And then figure out how many people I need to be able to detect that large of an effect. Okay? If you've collected the data already, and you have the alternative that's you know, given to you by the estimates, so, oh, we had 58% you know, successes, you can't do anything to increase that. I mean, that is what it is. But before you do any research, you can decide what effect size you're going to be looking for. Now, this needs to be done before collecting data, and it makes it hard to detect smaller differences. If you say, oh, I'm going to look for a bigger effect, well, then you might change how many people you're going to use. And if you decrease the number of people you are going to use, which you could if you are looking for bigger effects, it'll make it harder to find the smaller ones. If you are doing this, you should think hard about what type of differences are meaningful. Is 51% a big deal? Is 60% a big deal? Well, I don't know. So, what I just mentioned, power before and after, a priori. A priori means from the earlier. So this is determining power before you begin. This is like what I was saying in that last slide with the effect size, right? Easy to do. I can determine myself before I ever start what effect size I'm interested in, right? We can calculate power before we ever collect any data. That's what I did here. When we calculated the power for a true probability of success being 0.6, I was doing this a priori. How much power would I have if I did this? How much power would I have if I increased alpha to this? How much power would I have if I increased sample size to that, right? I am playing with these different parameters to see how much power I'm getting. And then I can, when I am happy with the power that I have and the other parameters, then I can start running my uh, study. If we do this a posteriori, this is not from the earlier, this would be from the, from the later, yeah. And this is going to determine the power after you have your data. So this would be like, okay, so the null hypothesis was that probability of success of 0.5. But we observed 62% successes. Now, if we observe 62% successes, how much power did we actually have to observe 62 or more successes, right? So we can look at how much power we have to observe the thing that we observe. And we can use this. It doesn't affect our statistical decision. The statistical decision is being made just on the basis of the p-value in alpha. But 
It can be used to supplement that. We can say, okay, we rejected the null hypothesis, and we had a lot of power, right? Versus, well, we rejected the null hypothesis, but we didn't have very much power at all. Right? If you have a lot of power, this suggests that you're looking at some big effect. If you have very little power, it suggests that the effect is really small. So remember when we talked about statistically significant and statistically non-significant? And I said that like statistically significant doesn't mean that it's like significant in the real world. Right? Could be that it's statistically significant, but completely meaningless. Now, if you have something that's statistically significant and you have evidence that it's a large effect, well, this suggests that potentially it's more meaningful than something that's just a small effect. And equally statistically significant. All right, so review. You should know the difference between one and two tailed hypotheses. You should know what alpha and beta errors are and how you can affect them. There's really only one way that you can affect alpha error, and that is what? How do you affect alpha error? By changing alpha. Yeah. Uh, how can you affect alpha and beta errors? You should know what effects changing alpha has on both of those. What effects changing the um, directionality of the null hypothesis has. What changing the sample size does. What changing the effect size does. You should also know the difference between a priori and a posteriori. Okay, we're finished. I'll hang around for questions and answers if you have any.